Welcome to part two of Serpent in the Bible, or Serpents. Uh, let's see. We were in the book of Exodus, chapter 7. And uh, I forgot to close it out and tell you it was part one, but this is part two. All right, so... Uh, Exodus chapter 7 and verse 15, Moses is going, been told by the Lord to go to Mo, uh, Pharaoh. Get the end of Pharaoh in the morning, lo, he goeth out unto the water, and thou shalt stand by the river's bank against he come, and the rod which was turned to a serpent shall thou take in thine hand. And thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Thus saith the Lord, In this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. And in the previous study we covered how in the book of Revelation the waters will turn to blood. Verse 18. And the fish that is in the water shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone." Now, having water to drink this is very important. You go three, four days without water and you die, right? So, a lot of people don't know it, but this is probably the Nile River, which is the lifeblood of Egypt. I mean, the Nile River was the, uh, that was the Fertile Crescent, as they called it. It was the crop growing area. It was very important. It was important to the Greeks under Alexander the Great. It was extremely important to the Romans, the Roman Empire. I mean, that's why everybody in that area wanted to conquer Egypt. So, because the Nile River, you could take sand, and as long as sand's got water, you can grow stuff in it. So, okay, verse 20, And Moses and Aaron did so, as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. Well, whoop de doo and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. Oh, okay, so, uh, for example, you, uh, the Lord's prophet says, Oh, I'm going to bring fire down from the sky and burn up the crops. And then you're going to have your magicians do the same thing, and then you're left with no food. And then you're going to say, Oh, see, we could do the same thing. I mean, this is a plague against Egypt. Now, I did a big... Uh, a series of plagues against Egypt contrasted to the plagues in Revelation. And the gods of Egypt were being challenged in all these things that Moses did. They had a god for the Nile River. So, I mean, God is the Lord God of heaven, the God of Moses, is challenging the gods of Egypt. All right, so, And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither did he set his heart to this also. And all the Egyptians dig round about the river for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. And seven, and seven days were filled after that, that the Lord had smitten the river. 
All right, let's fast forward to the book of Numbers. And if memory serves me correctly, the book of Numbers got its name because the Lord numbered the children of Israel. So here it is. All is. You had all the plagues of Egypt. The, the Passover happened. The death angel came, killed all the firstborn of the of the Egypt, and they told Israel, out, beat it, get out of here. You know, I, after all the plagues were done, I mean, Egypt was almost destroyed. So, Israel's being led of by the Lord, a pillar by day and, and well, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, they wander through the desert, or they're wandering through the desert, um, and uh, let's see, they're, we're going to Numbers chapter 21. Now, if you don't know it, the Canaanites, some of the tribes of the Canaanites were of the giants, the, specifically the, the Philistines. Perhaps you've heard of Goliath. He was a Philistine. They were one of the families of the tribes of the Canaanites. They, if when you read Genesis 6 about the giants and the sons of God, I've got an entire playlist on it. They were the fallen angels that tried to pollute mankind's race. I know it sounds a little far-fetched, but i tell you what, when you study it out, take a look in Job 38, you'll see it's true. I mean, it's that's why the world was destroyed in the flood, because God wiped out the giants, but they came back. And God told Israel to go into the land of Canaan and kill all the Canaanites. So if you don't believe in the fallen angel and giants theory, then you have to believe that God was a homicidal maniac that wanted all these nice Canaanites being killed. Take your pick. But the problem is most people, they won't read the Bible uh, they'd rather watch football and basketball and baseball and uh, as the stomach turns and the guiding light and um, general hospital. I don't know. I'm, I'm talking soap operas from the 70s and 80s. I don't know what soap operas they got now. Uh, soap operas today, uh, the husband says he's leaving his wife for her brother. Pretty, pretty sick, huh? All right, Numbers chapter 21, verse 1. And when King Arad the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, if thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. But Israel didn't keep the promise. They, they said it here, but they didn't keep their promise. Matter of fact, they ended, ended up marrying into the Canaanites. Verse 3, And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities, and he called the name of the place Hormah. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Okay, so this is what they're saying. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread Neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. In other words, there's no wheat, there's no bread, there's no water, 
And we're getting really, really tired of this mana stuff. I think the light bread they're talking about is mana. I, I think so. We're sick and tired of this. You know, why'd you bring us out of here? I mean, they, they quickly forget that they were slaves in Egypt. And I'll guarantee you, the Lord, all they had to do was walk and travel. You know, there's they're not carrying around heavy bricks and stones, you know. And they're speaking against God. They're speaking against Moses. And they watched all the miracles that the Lord did in Egypt. And yet they don't trust him enough to give them food to drink, water. I mean, water to drink, food to eat. And they're sick of the manna. Oh, we're tired of this stuff. Oh, boy. All right, so basically they're rebelling against the, um, the Lord. I mean, they have, they've seen the miracles, but they don't care. In 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 23, it says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And uh, what was the penalty for witchcraft? Death. All right, so the people are rebel. They're, they're speaking against God. They're speaking against Moses. They're saying, why'd you bring us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food. There's no water. And we hate the stuff that he's supplying. Verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents. Fiery serpents. You ever seen a fiery serpent? I haven't. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Fiery serpents. Serpents on fire? Uh, what were these, like? And, you know, angel, serpent, fire, I don't know what. You know, I don't know. What are these things? But all I know is they bite the people and, um, and much people of Israel die. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. Oh, yeah. We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Now listen to this. Make, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. Make it out of what? You know, he wants them to fashion, to, to create one. Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live huh so that if you got bit by a serpent a fiery serpent and you look upon the the serpent that moses is going to produce that he's going to make you're going to live hmm and moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole brass and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man when he beheld the serpent of brass he lived Huh, interesting, huh? Now, it takes a certain amount of faith. You know, when Moses says, all right, people, look at the serpent of brass and you'll, you know, you'll live. You've been bitten by a fiery serpent. Look upon the serpent and you'll live. That takes a certain amount of faith. Okay? I mean, the human mind's going to be like, I got bit by a serpent and you want me to look at a serpent and I'm going to be, I'm, and that'll make me live? That sounds stupid to the human mind. But it takes a certain amount of faith. Now, why did the Lord make a fiery, have Moses make a fiery serpent? I wish I knew. And if anybody has any ideas, I'd appreciate it in the comment section. I just, I don't know. Maybe it was for them to look, look upon the consequences of their sin that's about the only thing that I can think of. Yeah, look at the fiery serpent that I sent to punish you. You know, that's look at the consequences of your sin. 
I, I can't think of anything else. So, all right. And the children of Israel set forward and pitch in Oboth. All right. Well, that's the end of that. Let's go on to the next one. All right. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Now, the number 8 is interesting. Uh, the Lord made everything on uh, in basically six days, right? Uh, days one through five, God created the heaven and the earth and all the animals. Day six, he created man. Day seven, he rested. And on the eighth day, a baby boy was to be circumcised. Eight, according to Bible scholars, they say that signifies a new beginning. I mean, let's face it. Six days God created everything. Seventh day rested. The eighth day was the first day of the new week. So it was a new beginning. So, and Deuteronomy means basically like the second law. So, Deuteronomy 8, verse 1. Now, personally, I think this, this chapter applies just as much to Christians and believers in the Lord today as it did 4,000-something uh, years ago. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord Swear unto your fathers, and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee known that a man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Huh. Where have I read that before? That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. All right, uh, let's see. Where have I read this before? Okay, ah, Luke, the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 1. The beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Okay, Jesus went into the wilderness. Israel went into the wilderness, verse 2 being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward a hungered. 40 days Jesus was in the wilderness. Israel was in the wilderness 40 years. Verse 3, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, Command this stone that it be made bread. I mean, think about it. What, what is wheat? I mean, wheat comes from the ground. Uh, basically, soil is just rocks that are tiny, you know, tiny, tiny, much, much tinier pieces. Of, I mean, that's what soil is, mixed with, you know, organic materials. That's basically rocks. I mean, you crush up rocks and mix it with, you know, other stuff and leaves. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's, and then you plant wheat. Well, that's, that the wheat is basically from rocks, right? If thou be the Son of God, command the stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him saying, it is written. You know, when you're tempted of the devil, it's always a good idea to say, it is written. It is written. I mean, quoting scripture is 
I mean, how can you beat that, right? And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Hmm. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Hmm. All right, let's go back to Deuteronomy, verse 4. So here it is. They were saying, you know, you guys were hungry. I fed you with manna. Uh, you know, thy raiment, clothing, thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. See, when Israel wandered through the desert for 40 years, their clothes didn't get old, their feet didn't swell up, you know. Verse 5, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, that's a spanking, I know all about getting spanked by the Lord. I'm, I'm an expert on that subject. Trust me. As a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains, and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey." A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. You know, I always thought it was interesting. I watched a uh, YouTube video on samurai sword making where they went to uh, they have a uh, sand a sandy beach where they have what's called iron oxide we call it rust basically but they would take this iron they would put it in a furnace a smelter melt it and then they would turn it into a uh, let it cool a little bit and make it into a block then they would take the block they would heat it up and beat beat it and well they would when they would take the iron and, and mix it with um, carbon you know what carbon is charcoal coal charcoal uh, when you take iron and mix it with carbon that is what steel is and steel because of the molecular bonds is 10 times stronger than iron. And uh, so they would take the steel and they would pound it. And what the pounding would do is it would knock all the impurities off the steel. So if you had nickel or copper or whatever when you hit it they would fly off but the but the carbon and the iron molecules that were tightly bound together they would uh, you know they could beat it heat it up beat it and shape it and then they would fold it and do the process again and I've heard that they would do this repeat this process like a thousand times until the sword would become just one solid piece that was incredibly pure was an extremely time-consuming process. I heard it would take up to a year. I mean, I'm sorry, a month. A month for them to uh, make a, a, a top-quality samurai sword, uh, which is just unbelievable. The, uh, the strength, the purity, they've analyzed it. Uh, these things were hundreds of years old, and the quality of the steel is just incredible. Uh, you know, I mean, let me tell you something. If When you want to buy cutlery, 
The Japanese know a couple things about steel, trust me. So when they said a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass, you know, let's face it, that's, um, you know, iron is a very, very valuable thing. You know, we could never have built skyscrapers without steel. It would have been impossible. New York City's skyscrapers would have been impossible without steel. Absolutely impossible. These bridges across the, the rivers, like the uh, St. Louis Bridge, impossible. Impossible. Couldn't have been done. And, uh, you know, so, so God's bringing them into a place where there's wheat, there's wheat and barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, which is a fruit, olive oil, honey. You know, there's, they're, they're not going to be hungry. There's, they're going to be able to make tools out of iron and, and brass. Uh, it's, you know, he's, he's giving them all, everything they need. Verse 10, when thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Guess what? When the Christians came to this land in America, they found exactly all this stuff. And I know that probably not all the tribes of the Indians, but some of the tribes of the Indians were cannibals. The Native American Indians, a lot of those tribes, that from my research, they were cannibals. They performed human sacrifice. They, their religion was basically what I consider Satanism. You know, and, uh, you know, if you live next door to a bunch of cannibals and one of your children disappears, uh, I and I think you'd know what, uh, if you were a real man, I think you'd know what to do if you catch my drift. And that's what the Christians did. So... When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Has America done that? No. There was a time, but today, no. They don't do that. Verse 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest, when thou hast eaten, and art full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwell therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied. Yeah, when you're fat and happy. Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee, to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which ye swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. And it shall be, and it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, 
I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroyed before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. And people, if you don't think this is happening today, I hope you get saved. I really do. Because this is this is happening today. People have gotten fat. They've gotten happy. And guess what? We went from being the wealthiest nation in the world. We were the number one power at the end of World War II. Nobody could have challenged us. Nobody. Now we're the greatest debtor nation in the world. You've got Russia. You've got China. You've got traitors within, you've got traitors without, enemies within, enemies without, traitors within, and, and traitors without. America is having heathen aliens flood our land. We worship other gods, the New Age, Muslim, Buddha, you name it, they're here. Harry Krishna, we got it all. And I'll tell you what. And it shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. It's coming, people. It's coming. All right, let's go to the book of 2 Kings. This covers the, uh, the kings of Israel. Israel and Judah. 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Now, <laughs> listen carefully. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. So you got Elah, king of Israel, and Hezekiah, the king of Judah. Your demon nominational preachers will tell you that, ah, oh, well, all uh, Jews are Israel, and Israel are Jews, and they're all the same. Well, guess what? Israel here's got one king and Judah's got another king. How can they be the same? They got different kings. That's like saying uh, Florida's got a governor and New York's got a governor and they're both the same. New York and Florida's the same. No, they're not. No, they're not. And Israel and Judah had two different kingdoms. They're not the same. Your demon nominational preacher is a liar. Because they don't want you to understand. When you start asking questions, they don't want you to figure out the answers. So they lie to you. Verse 2. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. That was the capital of Judah. His mother's name also was Ab Abi, Ab Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. So here it is. Hezekiah was a good king. All right, verse three. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places. Remember when they built the tower to Babel, trying to build it to heaven? Yeah, they still do that. They go on the tops of mountains and worship the devil because they're not worshiping God. He removed the high places and break the images. What are the images? I idols. In the Greek, 
Uh, the word icon, that's what it means. It, it's an image. So when it says the image of Jupiter or the image of Mercury or Apollo, uh, you're talking an, an icon. It's, a, it's an idol. It's just, it just means the same thing in the Hebrew and the Greek. Old Testament was Hebrew. The New Testament was Greek. So he removed the high places and break the images. He smashed them to pieces and cut down the groves. Uh, okay, now, the um, witches and what have you, the Satanists, love to do their little worship services in the groves, now, in the, um, among trees. They even say that oaks, oak trees are sacred. You know, not, not the guy that created the oak trees, but the oak trees themselves. I mean, how stupid is that? Paul writes in the book of Romans, chapter 1, starting in verse 23, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. Why would he do that? Because they were worshiping the bronze or the brass serpent that Moses had made for those that had gotten bitten by the fiery serpents. I mean, how stupid is that? They're worshiping a piece of brass. Uh, bronze and brass are, you know, they're copper with, uh, I think, tin. Uh, I'm not. I know they're made out of copper. So, for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. Nehushtan. N e h u s h t a n. Can you imagine burning incense and worshiping a piece of brass? I mean, really, really. Verse 5, Hezekiah, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. You know, I would love the Lord to be, to be able to say something like that about me, but yeah, that ain't going to happen. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. He smote, he struck, he fought. He smote the Philistines, even unto Gaza and the borders thereof, from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. Hmm. And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmanser, S-H-A-L-M-A-N-E-S-E-R, Shalmanshesser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. Now, those of you that don't know it, Samaria was the capital of Israel, northern Israel. Remember, Israel had a king. Judah had a king. Samaria was the capital of Israel. Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. So he, so the king of Assyria came up against Samaria and he besieged it. He surrounded it. All right, now let's go to 
in verse 10. And at the end of three years, they took it. So the king of Assyria came up against Samaria, the capital of northern Israel, did a siege. That means you surround it. And when you surround a place, no food gets into the city. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what a siege is. And at the end of three years, they took it. The king of Assyria took Samaria, the capital of northern Israel. Even in the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria. He carried them away. He made slaves out of them. And put them in Hala and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the city, cities of the Medes. So evidently the Assyrians had conquered the Medes because after uh, at the end of the Babylonian captivity, uh, the Medes and the Persians had not only conquered Assyria, but they conquered Babylon too. You've heard of Darius and, and Cyrus the Great? Well, that was the Persians. The Persians are the modern day Iranians, and they allowed Judah to go back to their land and gave them everything they needed to rebuild the temple. They did a great service to Judah. So, and the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria and put them in Hala and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the city cities of the Medes. So he took these people and spread them all over his, he moved them. I mean, if you conquer a piece of land, uh, for those of you that weren't in the military, let me explain something. I was in the military. When you conquer a people, you go into their land and you conquer them, okay? They know the land. They know the area. They grew up there. I mean, you know, you, you get a guy that's, he's been all over the countryside. He knows where all the nooks and crannies are. He knows where the caves are. He knows where, you know, everything is. Perhaps he even uh, buried some weapons and food in certain parts around so that when he left or fled, he could go there and, and get stocked up with what he needed. So he knows where to hide. He knows where to fight. He knows everything about the land. Well, when you conquer in a land, what do you do? You take them, you, you remove them. You take them out of the where they lived and put them somewhere else. And then you take another people that from another place that you conquered and you, you just switch places. And then it's very, very difficult for them to rebel because you're in a strange land. You don't know the area. And uh, that's what they did. That's what they did. And let me tell you something. Israel, when you're conquered by a people, you're going to learn their language. Case in point. Mexico City was the capital of the Aztec Empire. Guess what language they speak there today? Spanish. Why? Because the Spaniards went there, saw the Aztecs performing human sacrifice and cannibalism, and they smashed their empire. They conquered them. And guess what? They learned to speak Spanish. They don't speak Aztec anymore. Doesn't, doesn't happen. Because... You don't want people speaking their native language because they could be speaking their native language and your soldiers wouldn't understand what they're saying, but they're plotting against you and your soldiers. So you're like, uh-uh, you're not going to speak Aztec anymore. You're going to speak Spanish. You're going to learn my language and you're going to only speak my language. And that is what happened to Israel. Israel went to Assyria. They were... They were probably forbidden to speak Hebrew. They probably had to learn the Assyrian language or wherever area they were in. And they forgot who they were.
And guess what? When the Assyrian Empire collapsed from the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians, Israel took off. You know, if you're in a if you're militarily conquered and you're in a territory and you're slaves and the government collapses and you know the soldiers have been recalled and they're they fought in a war but they lost and they're not getting paid, they're not going to be doing their job. I guarantee you if a, if if a city is in a riots and they're not paying the police anymore and they they tell the police, "Well, we we can't pay you anymore. Sorry." You think the police are going to stay on their jobs? No. No, they're going to go home and protect their families. They're not going to worry about getting paid for a job. They're, you know, doing a job that they're not going to get paid for. And they're going to go home and protect their family. Well, that's what happened to the Assyrian Empire. They were conquered by Babylon and by Persia and the Medes. And Israel, when they uh when they had a choice, to get out of town, they did. They left. That's a very interesting study. The uh, travels of Israel from the Assyrian captivity. Look it up sometime. There's some very interesting stuff. And I'll let you in on this little secret. They say they went into the Caucasus Mountains, which is where they get the word Caucasian from. All right. So... So the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria and put them in Halal and in Habor by the river of Gozan in the, in the cities of the Medes, 12. Why? Because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God. Because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded and would not hear them nor do them. Now listen to this. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. You see, the Assyrians took part of Judah too. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me that which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. And uh, at that time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. So he paid them off, basically. Now, if you want to keep reading, uh, the Assyrians went to Judah, uh, Jerusalem and they were going to um, try to take it. And they were bragging that, uh, you know, well, let's, let's. Let's read this. Um, verse 28. We're going to skip down to 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 28. Then Rab Shekai, Shekai, whatever the name is, stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language. So here it is, the Assyrian ambassador, or whatever he was, military leader probably, and he's talk, tell, yelling at the 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 uh, children of Judah, and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and the city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. So, uh, hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink 
ye every one the waters of his cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, olive, and of honey, that ye may live and not die, and hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arpad? Where are the gods of Shepharvaram, Hena, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of thine, uh, mine hand? So basically, he's saying, you know, you better not trust in the Lord God of Hezekiah. We're the Assyrians. We're conquering the whole world. Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But the people held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's command was saying, Answer him not. Then came Elikim, the son of Hilakah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joash, the son of Asaph, the recorder, to Hezekiah with their clothes rent, and told him the words of Rab Shakan. Okay. And it came to pass when Hezekiah, King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos. Now, Isaiah here, he has an entire book. Probably... Isaiah is probably, arguably, the hardest book in the Bible. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be the Lord thy God will hear all the world's words of Rabshashkin, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Um, all right. Now you can read the rest of the uh, this chapter. I mean, it's all, almost been almost an hour. Now, the reason the Lord was bringing this, because not only was Israel evil, but Judah was evil too. Uh, let's see. All right, let's skip to 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 32. Therefore, thus, now, now the, the Assyrians are blaspheming the Lord, but the children of Judah had blasphemed the Lord too. All right. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake, and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. That is one hundred eighty-five thousand. That is a huge army. That is a huge army. A hundred and eighty-five thousand troops dead by the at the hand of the angel of the Lord. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. 
So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. Where did Jonah go when he got spit out of the whale? He went to Nineveh. Remember, Jonah told the people of Nineveh to repent because they were evil. Verse 37, And it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the house of Nisrosh, his god, that Adramelech and Shazer, whatever, his son smote him with the sword. His own sons killed him. And they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Ezar, Isar Haddon, his own son, reigned in his stead. So, the Assyrians took Israel, they took a portion of Judah, and, you know, so it wasn't just Israel that went into captivity, it was part of Judah too, the Assyrian captivity. But the entire army that the Assyrians were going to use to take Jerusalem was was utterly destroyed. I mean, here it is. You're looking at 185,000 troops surrounding your city. And the next morning, they're all dead. How long would it take you to bury all those people? Quite a while, right? But the Lord did it to prove to the children of Judah and he told the children of Judah, you guys are not honoring me the way you should. And yet, he showed them mercy. Well, guess what? They, uh, later on, the Babylonians would come. And what the Assyrians failed to do, the Babylonians did. They came, they took Jerusalem took every killed people and took the rest captive to Babylon. And that's what the previous study I did uh, last night was about uh, Daniel. Daniel was one of the royalty of the tribe of Judah that went into the Babylonian captivity. So the Assyrians took Israel and part of Judah, and the Babylonians took the remnant of Judah and Jerusalem. All right, I think this is going to be the end of part two of Serpents in the Bible. Now, let me tell you something. God doesn't play around. Uh-uh. And people think, a lot of people will tell you that the God of the Old Testament was some evil, cruel guy. But the God of the New Testament is love, like there's two different gods. No. No. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. And the God of the Old Testament was a God of wrath. And the God of the New Testament is a God of wrath. But, however, under the precious blood of Jesus, we can, we can be shown mercy. But if you trample, but, the, but the, those that trample underfoot the precious blood of Christ, they're going to find out what wrath really is. If you don't believe it, read the book of Revelation. Oh, yeah. And I'm telling you, people, unless you've got a working knowledge of the Old Testament, the New Testament, yeah, you could find salvation in the New Testament alone. But the deeper things of Lord, you just, it's so hard without, you just won't have the understanding. All the symbolism in the book of Revelation comes from the rest of the Bible. A lot, most of it from the Old Testament. How can you understand the symbolism of the book of Revelation if you don't know the Old Testament and its symbolism? You know, the, when the Bible says that old serpent, the, the dragon, that old serpent, the devil and Satan, how, you know, well, the old serpent, you, you, if you don't think about, oh, well, Genesis 3, the serpent in the garden with Eve saying, oh, eat that, eat of that fruit of that tree. You know, you're not going to die. Go ahead. God's holding you back. 
You go, you go, girl. God's holding you back. You go, girl. You go eat that tr that fruit. No problem. You know, you wouldn't know that old serpent. There you go. You know, the New Testament, the Old Testament explains the New Testament, and the New Testament explains the Old Testament. They fit like a glove. Wear it. All right. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is the Christ, in his precious name. Amen. It's the end of part two, Serpents in the Bible.